If you've been around powerlifting for any period of time, you've probably heard of velocity-based training, or maybe you've seen somebody at your gym attach a weird little string like this to their bar before they lifted it. There's no denying a, a trend and an increasing number of people wanting to use bar speed to try to inform and enhance their training. So we're here at Calgary Barbell HQ today to answer some big questions, hopefully pretty simply, about VBT. We've got three main questions that we're gonna try to answer here today. Number one, what is it? How does it work? What's the idea behind it? Number two, why would you wanna do this? Why would anyone want to take bar speed measurements? How does that maybe help your training? And lastly, how would somebody go about implementing this or even experimenting with it if they did want to? So what is velocity-based training? Let's answer that question first. Now, in my own words, a working definition that I came up with would be that anytime you're using a bar velocity measurement to alter, to inform, or to prescribe your training, that is velocity-based training. But you don't have to just take my word for it. We actually were able to sit down with one of the best resources that I found in researching this video, a gentleman whose name is Landon Hickmott. Now he's Canadian, uh, he works with RTS, and he's also a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan in exactly this. He researches velocity-based training in powerlifting. I would say pretty darn good resource. Now, in his words, here's the definition of what velocity-based training is. And so I like to keep the definition of velocity-based training pretty, pretty open because mm -hmm. it has like endless utility. So it can be utilized for monitoring, for auto-regulating. What I've really been into right now for myself and for those that I, that I coach is with block reviews. I found it really be beneficial, but mm -hmm. overall definition, yeah, just utilizing uh, velocity metrics in order to prescribe resistance training. And just understanding that there's a pretty strong inverse linear relationship between increases in load mm -hmm. and decreases in velocity, as mm -hmm. well as a pretty strong inverse linear relationship between being closer to failure and decreases in, in barbell velocity. So that's kind of getting into how we can utilize it like for first repetition velocities, last repetition velocities, and, and so on and so forth. Now, big question number two, why the heck would anyone want to do this? Reason number one, because you can use the bar velocity to fine tune your RPE ratings. Now, of course, there's a little bit of legwork or groundwork to do in order to get reliable data and make the correlations between bar velocity and the RPE of a given set. But for any lifter who's maybe struggling to grasp RPE or for a lifter and coach who are having a hard time with the commonality in communicating the RPEs, having the very objective results of bar velocity in a given set can go a long ways to fine tuning and, and bridging the gap between the subjectivity of RPE and like I said, something more objective. Number two, you could use it to prescribe training. If you have a pretty firm grasp on these concepts, you could utilize a sort of hybrid RPE and velocity system to auto-regulate your training. You could tell your lifter, you're gonna do a set of four at an eight and then repeat until a certain amount of velocity is lost. Number three, testing and showing progress. It's all well and good to grind out a rep and call it a nat seven with a miss groove, but if you have an objective measurement of how fast that moved, and the next time you do that weight, it moves faster, well, then you've made objective progress. Number four, as a measure of readiness. So most people, when they go in and warm up for a session, you're going to a similar sort of last warm up before you get to your working sets. Now, the speed at which this last warm up moves is maybe one of the better predictors that we have to give you an idea of how ready you are or how well you're going to perform on a given day. So, if your last warm up, again, using the example of 220, if you move 220 slow, that might be an indication that maybe you should auto regulate your top set down. If you move it really fast, well, maybe you got some jam that day and you can go for a new PR or something. 
Number five, the fact that your velocity measurements tell you about the performance of your set in an objective manner can be really motivating for some people. Now, for somebody who benefits from this kind of gotta go fast mentality, this could be a really useful tool in keeping that intensity and focus each and every rep of a set. I think at the same time, and maybe for myself and others, this could be a double-edged sword where you're trying to get speed at the expense of maybe consistency or bracing or position, but for those that it works for, it could be a good tool. In our interview with Landon, we also spoke a little bit about why someone might want to incorporate VBT into their training, and here's what he had to say. So from a, from a practical standpoint, I'd say the biggest advantage is having like the self-competition with the velocity every single time you come into a training session. I think from like a practical standpoint, that's the biggest. Now, from a, from a research standpoint, we did a, a systematic review and meta-analysis, which basically gathers all of the studies on a specific topic. So mm -hmm. specifically, we looked at uh, load auto regulation. So, right, so adjusting uh, the load based on uh, velocity and, and RPE and compared it to more of like a traditional approach, uh, like a percentage-based training approach. Overall, we, we saw just a small benefit for auto regulator resistance training. Now, there wasn't really much of a difference between uh, velocity and RPE. However, there's only a single study that's compared the two directly and, and it actually demonstrated a significantly greater benefit for velocity compared to RPE on both the squat and the bench press in both of like a, a more traditional strength type block as well as kind of more like a, a power block. Now, that's not to say that, hey, velocity is better than RP. I'm not saying that at all, but it just kind of shows that, hey, maybe it can potentially give give a small edge to your training. And I think in, in mm -hmm. practical sense, you should be utilizing both for sure. Now to get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts, we're going to go into the how section and talk literally about how to set it up, as well as some of the different devices and options there are for taking the measurements. So in terms of the encoder, the unit itself, I have the one from rep1strength.com. This is the rep1 unit, it's 399 US. You can get 25 bucks off, use the code BRYCE25. And there's also the Vitruve unit, which is about 450 US if you wanna go that route. So both units will set up similarly. Um, I, again, I haven't really used the Vitruve one, but the Rep1 comes with a really fantastic app on your phone. You just Bluetooth to the unit. It tracks whatever you tell it to, and the click of a button, you can upload everything into a Google Drive sheet. Very easy to sort, manipulate all the data, and look at whatever trends you might wanna to try to suss out. Now, with that being said, there are a couple tips I have for how to actually set the unit up for each of the three lifts, so we'll go through that. All right, so to set the unit up, you're gonna need a plate to stick it to. The unit itself is really light, and if tethered to something, it's just gonna flop around and hang in the air. So a 2.5 kilo plate, a 1.25 or the pound plate equivalents. As long as it's flat, I wouldn't put it on anything with grooves because it's not gonna stick as well, but stick it on there. And then you're gonna wanna account for the walkout, right? So you're not gonna put it right under where the bar is in the rack, you're gonna put it back a little bit to account for where you're gonna be walking out to. Then you're gonna take the tether and in an ideal world in a narrower rack than this, you're gonna to wanna to attach it just inside of the sleeve. And the reason is because then you don't have to take it on and off every time you're, uh, you're adjusting the weight on the bar. This does come with a magnetic attachment as well, which is super easy to take on and off of the sleeve for squats. But in this case, because I only have the Velcro attachment, I would actually put it on the sleeve. Again, that's gonna dictate how far out the unit comes to. So in this case, again, I'd wanna try to line it up pretty much with, again, exactly where the bar is gonna be once you're unracked. Once it's hooked up, you're gonna turn the unit on. There's a little plus minus switch on the bottom. You're gonna open the app in your phone and pair it via Bluetooth. Go to the workout tab, and then you're gonna log what exercise it is and what load it is for each set. Within the app, there's all kind of functionality to change your set rest times, to change which parameters it's tracking, all that kind of good stuff. I'll leave that to you to explore, but that's sort of the basis of it. So for the bench, very similar setup. Again, you just want to take into consideration how far you unrack the bar. So for me, I actually unrack the bar pretty far out. Like I pull it out pretty far before I uh, start my reps. So for me, setting up just in front of the safety, coming up and again, with the bench rack being a little narrower, you can get the tether just inside the sleeve and leave it like that for all of your sets. Again, you just wanna log the exercise and the weight you're using. 
very easy. Now, depending on the bench that you have, you always want to make sure that the tether is not going to get caught on the safety should you miss a rep uh, or that, you know, the bar is going to impact it and the knurling is going to sever it or something. Just be cautious of any sort of interactions with that kind of thing. And again, you know, if you're somebody who pulls the bar out really far, you're going to want it a little lower down and vice versa if you don't unrack quite as far out. So to set up the unit for the deadlift, you're going to have to take into account whether you're sumo or conventional, as well as whether the bar is stiff or a, a bit bendy, like a deadlift bar or something. So on a stiff bar, sumo and conventional, you can usually get away with setting it up on the center knurling, depending how narrow your conventional stance is. Obviously, if the plate's going to get in the way, you got to do something else. If you're deadlifting on a deadlift bar, and it's going to be flexing a lot, you probably don't want the unit tethered to the center of the bar because that bar flex is actually gonna mess with the measurement a little bit. So the next best thing to do, and you're gonna to wanna to be a little careful so you don't crush your unit, is you're gonna to wanna to set it up tethered onto the very end and very outside. So on a deadlift bar, always like this. On a stiff bar, I use it in the middle. Does that mess with my measurements? Maybe. Is it probably more accurate on the sleeve? Yeah but also then you have to deal with it every single time you're putting plates on and off. So a couple different ways to do it for conventional, for sumo, and whether you're using a deadlift bar or a stiff bar. So now that you have an idea how to set the unit up, the next thing that you're gonna to need to do is to start understanding what the measurements that the unit gives you mean and what you can do with them. One of the biggest things that I recommend you start with is creating a very basic chart to help you draw some of those correlations we talked about earlier. So what I did when I first got my encoder was basically recorded for each of the lifts. So separately for squat, bench, and deadlift, I recorded my RPE and the velocity of each rep in that set. After a while, about two weeks of collecting data, I just took the average velocity reading from the sets I had recorded. Uh, of the last rep or the slowest rep of the set, that part's important, and the RPE rating for that set as a whole. So averaged each, and from there decided, okay, this is sort of the baseline, right? So for instance, on my bench press, 0.19 meters per second and an eight RPE. Those roughly correlated, and honestly, that's a good enough starting point. From there, I inferred that if it's slower, so if we're going down to 0.17 or 0.15 meters per second, then the RPE is climbing, right? That's maybe an eight and a half or a nine, respectively. And if the bar is moving faster, if we're going up in the meters per second as the slowest rep of the set, then the RPE is going down, the set's getting easier. That's how I did it. If you're interested, we also have another clip here of Landon talking about some of the other measurements that the bar velocity device is gonna give you and what they might mean. For power lifting context, arguably the best metric to utilize is what's called average concentric velocity. So I know many probably are familiar with that, but if you're not, no worries. So it's just the average velocity during the concentric portion of the lift. So in the squat, the bench press and the deadlift, it's all during the upward phase. Mm -hmm. Now the first rep velocity is, as, as it sounds, is the first of the fastest repetition velocity within the set. The last or the slowest repetition velocity is the, hence obviously, the last or the slowest repetition velocity within the set. So each repetition, right, will give you a specific velocity during that upward phase. Getting to those first and last rep velocity profiles. So yes, to establish one, like you can perform a 1RM test, but without performing a 1RM test, if you're somebody that's like a pretty experienced power lifter, say you're working up to like pop single at like a nine RPE, which is like mm, maybe around 95-ish percent for most individuals. What you can do is record the load. So record the absolute load that you use, like say 20 kilos, 75, 125, 175 kilos, 225 kilos. And let's say you made smaller jumps and you squatted 275 kilos at a top single at a nine. Record the fastest velocity during all of those sets. And then after that, predict your 1RMs to take like 275, divide it by 0 0.95 to get an estimated 1RM. Mm -hmm. And then what you have there is the relationship between velocity and the percentage of 1RM. And that's what you can utilize for like the first rep or the fastest rep velocity. Mm -hmm. And based on the research, we know that it's pretty reliable from session to session for an individual athletes and for uh, a given lift. At the end of the day, velocity-based training is 
another tool in the toolbox. It's not going to magically and immediately enhance your training, but if you take the time to understand it and to practice it and implement some of the things we've talked about in this video, I think it can absolutely enhance your training. I also can't strongly enough recommend Landon Hickbot's resources. Uh, I spent an afternoon going through a number of his YouTube videos, as well as a few of the articles he wrote for RTS, and I think those are a gold mine if you're interested. We're also gonna have a companion video of some kind, including the interview that we did with Landon, and if there's enough interest, we may even do an extra tutorial style video on how to build your personalized velocity charts. If that's something you're interested in, let us know in the comments below. If you think there's anything we missed or glossed over, if you have any questions, make sure to let us know in the comments below and like and subscribe, all that good stuff. We'll see you in the next one. Peace.